The Could Be Better Podcast Network is sponsored in part by the Frederick Let There Be Rock School. Let There Be Rock School, located in Frederick, provides a world-renowned music lesson program and an unparalleled after-school rock and roll community center. Listeners can now get their first lesson free when you tell them Could Be Better sent you. Visit www.frederickrockschool.com and click the contact button in the top right hand corner of the page to get yourself started again listeners of the show get their first lesson free if you tell them could be better sent you it's not too late or too early to learn your favorite olivia rodrigo dragon force or the black key song so now go now to www.frederickrockschool.com and reach out today for your first free lesson welcome to what I thought was the last episode of the podcast this year, this season, uh, the Could Be Better podcast. I'm here with Colin McGuire, and this... Oh, we just touched toes. Well, and unintentionally, but... um, Maybe you. Brought to you by our friends at Old Mother. Colin, is this the last time that we record here? Uh, I think we have one or two more in us. Well, I mean, in our souls, but like I'm talking about, like in this in the studios. No, that's what I think we can we can figure out a way to do another one here. Yeah, front desk. Brett cleared out his desk already. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe. I I don't know. No, I saw it. there's a I'm away from my desk sign when I pulled well, up. It was it was it was insane. So if anybody wants to apply for the job, <laughs> that's uh, email resumes at couldbebetter dot com dot net. Hey, dot net. Can, you just have to like. You know, only eat stuff that has your name on it, right? Like, we, 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 right. we have a fridge that we label things on. Big Everything. deal. Everything. Everything. You know, it's funny. I was um, <laughs> I was once in a living situation like that, and I, uh, I legitimately toyed with putting uh, sticky notes on my shit, <laughs> which would have been obnoxious. Hey, cursing. Oh, stuff. Yeah, I didn't. I'll, we'll, we'll get that in post, just like uh, Kiki and Stitch. We'll Oof. get that in post. They left it in. They that's that's what I hear. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, is Stitch gonna release an episode this week? Do we know? He should. Okay. I mean, I mean, today is people that are listening. It's the twenty sixth, and Colin's the executive producer on that show. And, uh, <laughs> that's right. The pay is great. Look for it on Indeed dot com because it's gonna be. A vacancy soon. This week we had Katie Powerly on. We've been trying to talk to Katie for a long Years. time, right, Chris? Years. Years. And she finally said yes. And I'm so grateful because I had a lot of unknowns answered. I She was a great guest. She was a great guest. The best specialty specialty segment we've ever had. Probably, yes. And I finally got to find out what actually happened at New Spire Arts with Dennis Quaid. Yeah, you were big on that. You Why brought is that it, up well, in our pre-meeting. It's like it's a bad thing. I just had a question. I mean, it's Dennis Quaid. What the, you, first of all, you initially called him Randy, which was <laughs> it's the same funny, thing. especially around this time of the year, because <laughs> Randy Quaid's role in Christmas Vacation is iconic. <laughs> I've never seen that movie. You've never seen that movie? No. Nope. And all I know is from all I know about Randy Quaid is that uh, he's nuts now. <laughs> he's, yeah. he's nuts and lives in a bunker somewhere. Shout out to our listener, Randy Quaid. Tin hats <laughs> are, they do help. That's, I'm into that. They're, yeah. But uh, uh, she told us a story about playing with Dennis Quaid. I thought, and I could be wrong, I thought we got that show. Did we, we do that? I, I mean, you sent the text. Was that me? It, it was a you, okay. sent, you sent the text, but we were the conversation because we, shout out to the a uh, former executive director and oboe player at the New Spire Arts uh, Center, uh, Gerard something. He said he needed an opener for and this. He came to yeah. us. Yeah, and what's, we didn't talk about this on the thing, but maybe some more inside baseball because this is what I care about. And so Katie's talking about being true to the integrity of who you are. So this is me. I like inside baseball stuff. So maybe people will too. But Dennis Quaid was not the first act that was supposed to play that night. It was supposed to be. Do you remember? No, what do you mean the first act? So he had that night booked for another oh. C-list celebrity band to come through and play, and it was the Bacon Brothers. Oh, that's right. Kevin Bacon was supposed to come. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And, and then he... Did. Wow, I can't believe you remember that. I remember all the dumb oh, stuff. Man. And so the Bacon Brothers couldn't make it because the, 
they were doing a BLT somewhere, and so they oh, got okay. They, <laughs> they got Dennis to come through, and um, Dennis Tomato. All of the <laughs> all of the moms were super excited because uh, he's a heartthrob in that movie called The Parent Trap. I think they did a good house that night, didn't they? They did. I, I think we heard that, and Katie seemed to be happy with they it. They did lose so. money, but they oh, they did. Well, they lost a ton of money, but. It's because he's very expensive, well, well, yeah. but it was had a, nothing to do with Gerard. Had nothing to do with Gerard. Uh, shout out to wherever he is now, yes. obo.co.uk. <laughs> I'd, uh, I'm no. I was happy. I was happy that we uh, helped with that, and uh, she seemed to like it. Right, mm-hmm. I'm yep. and that's your new thing too. <laughs> I think that this whole thing is like you know helped. <laughs> Gesundheit. It's good to help people. I mean, that's the reason why we do this. I would, I would hope. It's definitely not for the money. <laughs> Where is the money? Uh, it's in the bank account. <laughs> in my name. Yeah, underneath that's my pillow right. Case. Yeah. It's have... under West Perry. <laughs> yeah, it's his college fund. So uh, uh, we have uh, we have some shows coming up. Since yes. this is out on Thursday, there's a show coming out this or coming up this weekend. I am personally very pumped. Two shows, but there is at least one that I'm very pumped on because I love flow. And I love Tad. Baby photos, baby. And I love ba- I love those people in baby photos. Did you do the assessment that, that Danny sent us? It was the, I uh, did not, no. Uh, oh. It was like a, um, hey, how, how to love yourself. Kind of like. I love her. We, we should have them on every. They brought donuts and flowers. Mm-hmm. And they they bring it when they play it. I mean, it was Sky Stage night. It was a beautiful yeah, time. That was that was great. They were great that night. They're they're great people. We should have them on again someday. Someday, um, but yeah. So Friday night at Old Mother, six thirty. Baby photos is gonna rip one. Then Flo's gonna rip one. Not like farts, cause that's weird, guys. And then um, and then Tad's gonna rip one, and that one might be a fart. We don't know. But then the next night, and again, it's free, right? You know, all, uh, twenty-one a drink, all ages to attend. Then the next night, we get a special final, could be better, old mother show of the year. It's ever it's Saturday, uh, the third. Yeah. Saturday sure. the second. We can. Uh, I'll look that up. It's one of the days. Uh, I'm pretty it's, sure. It's, it's, I think uh, it's. I think it's twelve two. It is Saturday the second. Yeah. yeah so it's so Saturday December second. That's literally, guys. It's two days from now. Saturday. It's humidity glow. It is. <laughs> I, I wish. Rip. <laughs> I. They're Zach, still going. Zach, They're come just back. Go- I'm sorry you got COVID and couldn't play that show. That was not a fun time. <laughs> but that's what you get for flying. Um. Uh, it's going to be Hostel Ray, uh, which is oh. which is Brody Barber, uh, illustrator designer of all things could be better. His band. Why have we not had them on this show? We had Brendan on. He's one of the first guys we had on. I think. Uh, I don't remember that. It was a long time ago. A long time. Um, he he was one of the he was first season for sure, first season bud. Um, but uh, and if I and if I got that wrong and he hasn't come on the show, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm right. pretty sure we had. Um, and so it's ho- so it's Hostel Ray. It's uh, this band Pulses from Virginia. They're awesome. Um, and then uh, Bliss House, their final their final show, right? Final show. That's right. Say goodbye to, to Sam and EJ and. Why are they breaking up? They said that we're tired of being a house, and sometimes it's just tough holding it all together. You know. I love EJ, man. Remember, we were supposed to play some songs with EJ. I saw EJ. So after we did our our infamous Samuel Powers interview for the paper. Uh, oh boy, that was great. That was a uh, fun time by nobody. <laughs> and uh um we <laughs> uh Brody and I walked down to Nola and EJ and Jacob were there oh. uh, getting some coffee, so we got to say hey and it's pretty cool. EJ's a good dude. But he's uh he's quitting. It's quitting time, huh? Not for you. I mean EJ's in that other band with Chris Duquino and he's in that other band with him and, and so Josh. Violet uh, Evergreen? Yeah, he's in Violet Evergreen, he's in uh Paper Lanterns, but instead of a A it's a V, so it sounds like Lanterns. Like churches. Pretty much, yeah. Except like different. More like Twinkle Rock than like Oh wow. Than like uh That sounds like such a derogatory term. I didn't say twin say twink rock. It's different. A twinkle. Yeah, like like tw- like Twinkle Rock, like like Twinkly Midwest emo, the tappy tappies. Uh, well, no, I don't know. Like Spitalfield. 
No, but that's, that's funny. <laughs> that's, nobody's going to get that. Who's I love that to this. so much. Um, <laughs> Spitalfield was great, by the way. They had a great drummer. He, for a year. the singer, just did a Blink One Eighty Two cover on some compilation. No. For the, um, yeah, yeah, Andrew from Spitalfield. Oh man. Yeah. Um. Anyway, <laughs> shows this weekend is all on the website. You're already going, so why am I telling you? Um. But but seriously, support your local. Uh, brewery and your local music scene because sometimes they can be together and sometimes they can be mutually inclusive and who knows when the last show will be and who knows when the last podcast will be this could go at any second or it could continue forever it could it's up to you return to forever well wait Further seems forever. God, please uh, bring I'm, him back. <laughs> the moon is down. <laughs> Between Spitalfield and Further Seems Forever, don't tell me I don't got no cred. Listen, all I <laughs> number one gun wasn't that bad. Oh, come on, man. They weren't. Give okay. me one more. Give me one more from that that. Oh that era. no! Are you no. gonna tell me Texas is the reason? No. Oh. Now you're going deep. Now you're going way way deep. You know. Let's go first album, Armor for Sleep, before Armor for Sleep became Armor for Sleep. Yeah. They put out a new Very album good. this year or Did last they? year. Mm-hmm. It's Did, not terrible. I saw that they- uh, It's boring, but I mean- They took the Car Underwater album out for like an anniversary tour. Did yes, they, they do did. that? That was recent, mm-hmm. wasn't it? Yeah. That, that album's still fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Love that. I saw I saw them open for Taking Back Sunday in Pittsburgh and- uh, Smalls? No, no, no. It was on the on the campus of Robert Morris University. I took my brother. It was his first ever concert. He fell in love with Armor for Sleep. Uh, how? Okay, I'm gonna ask. So I'm <laughs> sorry. How long ago? Like what year? Oh God, I was well, at least twenty years. That's um, disgusting. No, maybe maybe eighteen, seventeen. So here's no, so better. the first band was Armor for Sleep off Car Underwater. Mm-hmm. The second band was Under Oath. <laughs> They're only choosing safety. Yeah. And wow. then the third band was taking was taking back Sunday, and uh, that was off of the second record. I can't remember. The oh, name of oh, it. oh! Uh, Listen now. No, Listen no, no. louder now. now. Louder now, yeah, louder now. That's so not the was, second. That was the third one because the first one's the Naked Baby. Oh no, no, no! You're right. Yeah, louder yeah, now. That had know. liar, and that had yeah, make liar. damn sure. And and what Corey it feels had, like. Bow, 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 bow. Yeah, what it feels like to be a ghost. Yeah. That's the name of that song. Man, I love. We could do a whole podcast on this. I you should have said my brother was like I don't know fifteen and I, or That's fourteen for and I was like we're ten years apart so either I was twenty four or twenty five and he was fourteen or fifteen and he had never been in a pit dude That's and a good I, show. he looked like he was gonna die man I had I literally at one point I had to grab him by the neck it was it was tough true love was Under Oath <laughs> bad they were okay. I've never been a big under oath person. I think, I mean, all of my friends, especially during that time, just fell in love with that band. Love that band. Did you? Because oh, yeah. they're oh, they're a Christian, bit. right? Yeah, yeah. They, they were the like they do this. I mean, they were they were the best band to do screamo in like the Christian thing, and like they just blew up. Like, I mean, I I, yeah. I you know I remember getting that record and just being like, "What is this? This is so awesome." Unrelated, although this. We we clearly have set the groundwork to have a full episode on this, but did you see? I'm sur- I'm surprised I didn't send this to you because I did send it to a couple people. Wow! Did you see the, the lineup for the 2024 when we were young fest? Okay, so you don't you, have to look it up because here you here's, sent it to me. And I oh, did, did I? I did. Okay, and I don't think I responded to because I was like, "What is this?" No, because you never responded to me. That's no, cool. Actually, no, you didn't. It was, it was one of my other friends sent it to me. Oh, your better friends, I don't but know. someone um, that sends me stuff. But every si- so, I thought this was so funny, and I wanted to get your. I don't really. I mean, your thoughts. Well, it doesn't matter. Yeah, but they're pennies. That's <laughs> every. They got every single band to do an album except for one band, which cracked me up. Who? Are you looking at the the yeah, poster? So, yeah, it's. A, I mean, it's everybody. Look at the top, the very top of the poster. MCR and Fall Out Boy, but all, Fall Out Boy just said we're not playing one record. We're just gonna do everything. Yeah, do, which is awesome. That's that cracked me up. Like even My Chemical Romance was like, okay, we'll do this album, and all those other bands will do all the albums that they are but supposed Fall Out Boy, to do. Their new record's not bad. 
my, uh, I guess full circle on this whole conversation. Do you know who got me into that new record is my brother. He's like, have you heard the new Fall Out Boy album? I'm like, no, why would I do that? I'm 80 years old. Exactly. He's like, uh, no, listen to it. And Dude. the last time I was down there, I can't remember when I visited. I was last time I was in Florida. He played me the whole album like twice. It's good. And, and he was like, this is so good. I, it's it's surprising. It's like they kind of got that weird ESPN rock stuff out of their system because they made so much money, and now they're making cool music again. Well, I also love that they're like, we're not doing no albums. No. Like everybody, literally every, the co-headliner, the biggest names on that poster for that festival next year, they are doing complete albums, not Fall Out Boy. They're Good saying, nah, brah. Love it. <laughs> I mean, I guess they're just saying that they're more timeless than any other band. Oh, I see what you did there. And you know what's more timeless than any other band? Our guest today, Katie Powderly, talks about all sorts of things. New music, new vinyl. You can pre-order this. And I loved Katie's whole thing because she is talking about um, being genuine with music, being true to yourself, and giving fans and people and listeners of uh, of her music something special to take away from. So you can pre-order the vinyl now, and it's five songs um, that is uh recorded live and then there's five songs that are not recorded live and they are all very special so you can pre-order it now links are in the show notes colin this was fun it was and it was also we should say this she mentions this but uh shout out to our good friend uh kenny eaton mystery ton studio she recorded all of these there um this was we've been wanting to have her on for a long time we finally got her on she's an amazing artist Amazing new music. Check it out if you can. For now, though, here's our first song, and we'll see you next week. Tobacco. Look at you Doing all the things that bad men do Trying to convince me it ain't true Telling pretty lies I see right There you go, alluding to the fact you'd buy a ring. Like you believe in doing the right thing, chasing every girl who likes to sing. You burn through them like cigarettes before you put one down. You lit the nest. You like the smell that lingers on.
salvation Sure as hell can't buy salvation I won't let you cut me down to size You are a devil in disguise And I can see through all your lies You are a devil in disguise Why won't you look me This podcast is brought to you in part by Special Tees. Are you in a band that wants merch but does not know where to go? Are you looking for great quality and affordable pricing? Do you have a design that you'd like to put on a koozie for your favorite consumable beverage? How about office swag for your job or giveaway items for all of your events? Okay, you get the point now, but you have to look no further than Special Tees for all your heart's printing desires. The Could Be Better podcast listeners can act now and get 10% of your first order if you tell them Could Be Better sent you. Visit their website at www.special-tees.com or use the link in the show notes to get the conversation started. You can even call ahead and visit their showroom to see all types of products, everything that they offer. Again, telling them Could Be Better sent you via email, phone call, or carrier pigeon. It'll get you 10% off your first order order that's www.special-tees.com special tees if you haven't worked with them they want to work with you we are here with katie powderly hi 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 um katie we talked a little bit about this in our uh could be better studios lobby i said when we first started this podcast you were on our list of uh guests to come on so it's very feels very full circle that this might be our last time recording in the studio that you're now finally here. So thank you for coming. We're really excited. Thanks for having me. Where are you guys moving to? We're, we're moving to Romania. Mm-hmm. We, oh, that's a music hotbed, really. <laughs> okay. That's, the food, uh, the cuisine is really what we're going yeah. for. A lot of Roman noodles, as they Just say. The Roman oh, noodles. you see. Boo. Anyway. So, Katie, this is this is great. We wanted to bring you on because we know you have a ton of m- new music. This is true. Which is very exciting. I kind of wanted to start with that because I'm going to guess the song we just heard to lead you in will be a new song on some of these new projects, right? Yes, this is true. <laughs> so how did this all come together? Um, well, uh, the song that you just heard is called Tobacco, and that was kind of a weird project because I'm releasing music in a non-linear fashion. It's not in the order in which I recorded it. Um, I have a full electric band that's been based out of Frederick for 10 years now, and we have had an album in the can since before the pandemic. Mm. But um, And I had planned to release it in the early part of 2020, and I think we all kind of remember um, how that <laughs> um, went. And so... Um, I was just kind of getting my bearings. I, I think I've like moved like six times since then. I've just been um, in a period of lo- a lot of transition and trying to figure out how I wanted to manage that release. And in the interim, um, I think collectively and also personally, there have been an enormous amount of events that have transpired during that time. And I've been doing what songwriters do, which is writing about it. Um, I spent a summer. Um, swimming in the Shenandoah River and spending a lot of time in Virginia and West Virginia and hiking in the Appalachian Mountains. And um, I did a lot of writing that summer um, and just kind of processing. That was more of like a personal level processing. It wasn't about broader cultural topics, but tobacco was definitely part of um, a project that felt very separate from my work with the Unconditional Lovers. It felt more like Appalachian ballads kind of vibes instead of like electric band vibes. And so I feel like I kind of returned to my original roots, which was um, more bluegrass adjacent kind of folk music um, with an acoustic guitar. And um, one of my uh, bandmates, I was in a bluegrass band at that time. I was playing upright bass um, in a Pennsylvania based bluegrass band called Dead Horse Revival for the last two solid years. And my bandmate from that band, I would play his songs in his van. I would play bass and sing harmonies in that band. And then um, Chance Hurley, who was like the band leader of that band, um, played guitar and mandolin with me on this project. So we kind of took turns um, supporting each other's creative endeavors. And so this is the 
the album called Live by the Song, Die by the Song is the byproduct of that summer of writing. And this is the acoustic stripped down, more organic sounding sounds. It's like what you hear when you're in a room with me, as opposed to like the Unconditional Lovers electric sure. album is more um, sounds of like amplification and some effects and pedals and stuff like that. And it's very fully produced and very polished. And I'm not saying that this isn't polished, but there's definitely a juxtaposition there, sure. like acoustic versus electric. So I thought it would make sense to re- uh, release this first since it's um, more intimate and then sure. go big with the Unconditional Lovers album next year. So with Chance, did you do any of the writing with him at all? Or was it you? I write all my stuff, just and he writes all his stuff, and it's separate. We would try to co-write, and I've just never been able to do that with anyone before. <laughs> sure. um, it feels really embarrassing and vulnerable and awkward, like like trying to like have your first kiss with braces on or something like that. It's just like <laughs> I know that like this could be a beautiful thing, but I don't feel ready to do this. It just also writing is such a a personal thing for me that I can't really relinquish control I think potentially I might be able to say at some point in the future I'll write the lyrics and you write the melody but then it's got to be conducive to for me to sing it yeah. and like in my range and what is powerful for me to sing so sure. I don't know that I I haven't yet experienced a relationship where I feel like I can ho- kind of delegate that responsibility to someone and also if I'm being honest I need to be the boss and I need so I'm happy to be in someone else's band and have them tell me what to do and play what they want me to play and sing what they want me to sing. But with my songs, I just, I have to be the boss. How did that go? Excuse me. How did that go with the unconditional lovers thing? Cause that was a band of great musicians that you had in. Did you tell them I want this here? I want this here. Is that how that went? Um, yes. So there were, um, I, it's, <laughs> It's kind of like benevolent dictatorship vibes. (laughs) Um, So there's, I'm not saying that there's no collaboration. Like I definitely have input, but ultimately the vision is mine. Mm -hmm. So like um, Colin is a great example. Colin Schultzberger, who plays keys in the Unconditional Lovers. And he played the snare and the roads with me on two songs on this album. Live by the Song, Die by the Song um, album I'm releasing right now. But um, he is such a great person to work with and to collaborate with because I can tell that man to do 109 takes and he will do it without a crappy attitude. He'll (laughs) smile and be like, okay, so what do you want more from here? And I'm like, more whatever. And we can talk about it. it. And it's he never gets like a chip on his shoulder. He's super open and receptive to feedback and is always super willing to do what best serves the song in my eyes and by my eyes I mean my ears it's like he understands that I and they all do but it's just um I feel like because we've probably spent the most time together out of all the my other band members our communication has gotten to a point where he just it, the trust is implicit he just knows. and you don't need to, like the communication becomes nonverbal and when it is nonverbal we know how to talk to each other so nobody mm-hmm. gets offended it's very sibling kind of vibes and so we just work really well in that sense um and there are times where it can be frustrating like I've been in the studio working on other people's stuff before and it's like got to do it again I don't want to or I liked how that turned out and they it's like ultimately we all want the final say because, but when you have to defer to someone else's vision, I think it can be frustrating, but I think everyone knows um, that that's what this project is about. It's, uh, it's about my songs, my vision. Yes. Do we collaborate to some extent? Yes. Am I open and receptive to ideas? Yes. But ultimately it's like, I'm trying to convey a certain thing and my way is the way that it, like the final word, I guess. Yeah, it's your it's your vision, like you said. Mm-hmm. Like I would, it's got to be something you are very. I mean, if I was in your position, I would not want any stone left unturned. You know, like I would say, hey, this is these are the drums. This is how I want this to sound. Mm-hmm. Same thing with bass. Same things with guitar, piano. Colin seems to be like a great person to collaborate with. That, like you said, because mm-hmm. I feel like he is a professional to the core, right? Oh, for sure, and he's. I mean, when we first met, we were 10 years younger than we are now. And I feel like he has grown professionally so much. And I have I've always had a lot of respect for him as a musician. But 
that continues to grow and he continues to impress me. Um, he can do stuff. He knows what I like because I have very strong capital O opinions about <laughs> sound and Kenny knows this mm-hmm. and Kenny's like a brother to me too. We've worked together for 10 years. I was going to ask you about that. Did you do these songs at Kenny's? Yes. All of them, all of my stuff is at Kenny's. Okay. Mystery Ton Studio shout out, right? Kenny! Yeah, that's... <laughs> my bro! Yeah. So we are on the sibling level because Kenny and I can like... And I think my bandmates and I too not fight in so far as like we're not really bickering but we can disagree we can agree that like okay we need to take a time out go upstairs get some air just like take a breather and come back and communicate but I think the beauty of having these and this is what I'm striving for for the rest of my career is to have these long-term mutually beneficial respectful working relationships with people who we've already got 10 years under our belts and at this point Kenny and I are nonverbal like he knows what I want. He knows how I like it. He, we don't, it saves us so much time in the long run because we already know what mic I prefer, prefer for my voice to go through. We already know how I like things to be mixed. I like things in a very specific way. I mean, every single detail you hear is because I wanted it that way. And I don't really relinquish a lot of control. And I think those guys accept me, they respect me, and they just, when we're working on a team in that way, they are happy to do their part and I can't think of anyone I'd rather have on my team than the collection of my collaborator collaborators that I have so I feel super thankful and that's actually I've thought about moving away quite a bit but I the thing that continues to lure me back and to continue to stay loosely based out of this area is the community of collaborators that I have here and that repertoire of like sonic understanding of what I'm looking for and that that relationship of communication where it's become so efficient Mm -hmm. it saves us hundreds of hours of time at this point because we just know how it's going to be and we just get to business and it's like efficient yeah and starting over sounds scary i mean because you know from working downtown from being in unconditional lovers and like forming this community of people that you know then moving to some place in the middle of nowhere and just restarting that sounds daunting but I don't, you probably don't know about my life then because I've lived in 31 places in a bunch of different states. I've moved around a lot sure. and I, um, I am not afraid to move somewhere new and start over. Um, I've done that a lot of times in my life. I've lived in quite a few states, but um, I, I think that, I, I don't know. It's just, I am definitely a free spirit and I'm a wanderer and a, a rounder, but I have really appreciated what we have built together here enough that it has kept me um, magnetized to this area and also the culture here like I the kind of music that I grew up playing is indigenous to the this mountain range where we live and um, I grew up with a a father that played bluegrass music he's a banjo player and a guitar flat picker Um, I grew up listening to music from this Kind of, this is an epicenter for a certain kind of music. And so uh, I really appreciate that in the geography. And we're very blessed to be here. So, and I can appreciate it because I've lived a lot of places that don't have what Frederick has to offer. So yeah. I feel like I have a, a fair um, point of comparison because I've lived so many places. It's easy to take it for granted when you're from someplace and yes. be like, oh, it's it could be cooler. Well, it's like, you have it pretty good, actually. <laughs> it could be way crappier, as a matter of fact. So, I and I noticed, at least from checking out Instagram and tour dates and stuff, there's a lot of shows around here, but there's not a lot of shows in, in Frederick. And I know you've done your time of playing mm-hmm. in Frederick, but so I, I guess, is, is Frederick just the special place for special current shows now, or is there, it's just until the feeling's right, maybe to come back and play in Frederick? Well, I just played um, at Sky Stage like a Over month ago. Summer. Uh, in October, actually. So it was just cool. a month ago um, with my friend from Tennessee, Chancellor Lawson. He's one of my favorite songwriters. If you want to look him up, he's uh, just incredible. But um, And I have played um, Hub City Vinyl a couple of times in Hagerstown. Yeah, and they just redid that whole space, mm-hmm. didn't they? It's really cool. Yeah, so um, I, I do play in Frederick, but it's more of a special occasion. Like, I'm not like a, like a bar band where I play listening room environments for this work and it doesn't the kind of songs that I play and the kind of stories that I tell in the show that I put on it's it's not able to be received in when it's like a background band or like background music or background noise um and I'm definitely not like I've been in fun party bands before but this is definitely not that this is 
a dialogue in it. So I play listening room environments. And also I don't play so often that like when I, when I play, you got to come. Otherwise you're going to miss out. Sure. Um, so yeah, I'm, I, I was going to mention, not to interrupt you, I was because you were, you mentioned listening rooms or do you have a favorite place or two around this area to play? Mm. Hub City Vinyl is really special. I really like that. S- Sky Stage was absolutely magical for sure. Um, I feel like, um, I think in this immediate area, those are my two favorite places. Um, I, the, I love the Weinberg Center probably best of all, but it's more difficult um, for a band of my size to, to play the Weinberg on a regular basis. But we've played there a handful of times, like maybe four times, I think, mm. um, with different iterations. But um, yeah, the, the Weinberg, I think, is ideal, um, but then on a smaller scale. I did enjoy the new Spire Arts as well. That was a nice, and we'll, a yeah. nice room. Mm. We'll, we'll get we'll get into that. We do okay. want to talk a little bit about that. But one thing uh, to circle back quickly to the new material, um, you do you think? And I I'm just wondering this. I haven't heard any of it yet. I'm very much looking forward to hearing some of it here. And we've already played a song that we've not listen to here in person but we will listen to by the time this goes up yeah i'm really excited to hear it were these songs the way that you described the sort of songwriting process would you categorize these songs as is is happy as sad as is anything <laughs> do you have that's hilarious because clearly you haven't heard this yes if you're asking me this question <laughs> um they're very dark ballads um very much reflecting on um, the darker parts of people's behavior, um, kind of seeing through uh, the veneer that people put on when they're trying to por- portray themselves as one way, but you get a sense intuitively that there's something underneath the surface that doesn't align with what the words are saying. Just kind of um, trying to figure out people's motives for deception or... Um, and and I think there are some hopeful messages in my songs too, but you, it's a little bit, you got to dig deeper. Um, the next song that we're about to play later in the show is called My Morning Dove. And I, th- I've gotten mixed reactions from people who've listened to this. Um, they didn't get this takeaway from it, but um, it's very much about encouraging someone who um, – is a troubled person who is kind of you're afraid that they're too far gone and you're trying to trying to lure them back um, from the depths of whether that's depression or alcoholism or just dark thoughts or despair. Um, it's about trying to say like, look, you need to make efforts. Like I can try to reach out and save you, but and I will try to save you, but I can't save you if that means I'm also going to drown in your stuff so um it's about it's it's a mixture of being trying to be uplifting but at the same time acknowledging this is really taking a toll on me and um so trying to encourage people to come back to themselves and get out of their own world of despair because I think we've all been through a lot in the last handful of years and sometimes you need your friends the people who love you the most whether that's a romantic relationship or a platonic relationship or a colleague or whatever you need someone to speak frankly with you and I've never been able to be really graceful at subtlety I've always been a very direct person I don't understand why people aren't direct with me I'm like it's exhausting for me to try to figure out what they mean so (laughs) I'm a direct communicator and that's what my songs are it's like hey your behavior and your actions or your words and your actions are not in alignment what's up with that that's like tobacco um Mm. (laughs) You're telling me you're a good guy, but you're acting like a bad guy. What's up with that? <laughs> and then my morning dove is like, I love you, but like, I can't be submerged in the darkness of the water that you're swimming in or whatever. It's like, you got to try to help yourself. Like everyone else is trying to help you too, but you have to take action on your own behalf. Well, let's, we'll hear that right now. Then my okay. morning dove, we'll put yes. that in. All right. Okay. The morning doves are crying. They're calling you by name There ain't no use denying Which one of us is to blame We knew that it was dangerous Two moths drawn to a fire I just can't say no to you You touch me like an electric wire 
What have you done? What have you done? What have you done? What have you done? We knew from the beginning We knew the stakes were high But something about the way you kissed me While you're looking me dead in the eye You had me up against the wall, babe You caught me from behind Praying on the floor and all fours Was temporarily blind What have I done? 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 an absolutely lovely song and now i understand why you said they are sad songs yeah. we heard that in the in the break it was uh, it was it was amazing i i'm i'm interested to know how the last time well you and i really did something together when uh you talked about the weinberg playing the weinberg yes. um one of those times that you played the weinberg was part of the frederick music showcase true that was and my first time and um, it was a great set. I remember, like, I had so many people come up to me and ask me more about you. And I was like, oh, check her out online and do all this stuff. And, and John Healy really fell in love with you, too, that night. I know he really liked um, the music and all that stuff. That feels like, now, what was that, eight years ago? Mm-hmm. Nine years ago? Something <laughs> yeah. like that? Yeah. And you were just talking about the 10-year time frame. Uh, mm-hmm. You said that before the break. How have you grown as a songwriter in oh those gosh. 10 years? I mean, that's a really difficult thing to answer because I, I think songwriting is like a lot of other things. I think in performing and recording, it's it's like any other skill. You have to do it and do it badly for a certain length of time to kind of hone your chops and like this podcast we do it badly (laughs) for a very long time until we hone our chops but go ahead but I think um you just certain lessons are just only learned by doing and failing and reflecting or in my case just ruminating for years on what I could have done better or how I could have said something in a more impactful way or um, more graceful way and I think it's just um I think it's, I've grown so much, I feel unrecognizable 
Um, From where you were 10 years ago? Absolutely. And I, I I look back on that version of Katie and I'm, and I hear recordings that we made at band practice and stuff. And it sounds like a cacophony, but I'm so proud that we ended up getting to this point where there's discernment. And I think um, I have so many strong opinions about how music, how my, I want my music to sound. And I think we've really, throughout the recording process, really nailed um, achieving that in a studio environment. And then from a writing perspective, I think I've just gone through more impactful life events that are very poignant. Some are very beautiful, like love. Um, some are devastating, like betrayal or loss. And so I think I've just become more mature and seen things through multiple lenses over the course of many years. And so I have a better perspective and I've, I also, um, have the benefit of testing out a lot of my material in, in front of live audiences. I have secret little, um, like songwriter communities where I work on new stuff and bring it out in front of a group of other songwriters. And if I can't get the room to stop talking while I'm playing my new songs, chances are it's just not landing for them. So I see what makes people stop their conversation, turn around and speak. This is not like formal gigs, by the way. This is sure. like songwriter, like secret hangs. Societies, like, yeah, 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 totally. And if, if, if I close my eyes to start singing and I open my eyes and everyone is silent and looking at me or if they physically walked closer to me, I know that I'm onto something. But it just takes years of just performing in front of people and getting your confidence and figuring out what kind of vocals are sound best with my range and what words like what resonates with me when I'm listening to a song and I'm a huge nerd and I've been um criticized for using just I was told in an insulting way that I'm like that I sound overly academic all the time but um how was that insulting I would be so complimented (laughs) he did not mean it as a compliment um do you want to name names we could say (laughs) no (laughs) he's a butthead but I love him um and so I but I realized like I've just gotten to this place of total self acceptance where I'm not trying to, in some ways, like I'm the things that I write that are the best I write for myself and I'm satisfied with it. And I, then I get further confirmation when people respond by listening, but it's not like I'm, I'm not writing for it for the audience's approval because I feel like I've written songs where I'm like, people will love this or it, I thinking it'll appeal to people and it ends up not, and it doesn't appeal to me either. And I think that's probably translates in the way I perform it. It just, the things that emotionally impact me that I want to sing seem to be the things that people stop and pay attention to. So it seems like there's like this litmus test of integrity. If I'm in alignment with my integrity and writing the truth as I have experienced it, that impacts people. If I try to dilute it or get out of talking about the hard parts of stuff, people don't really pay attention. So I think as long as I maintain my integrity, but that's such a difficult thing to convey to somebody else because I'm the only one to know whether or not I'm telling the truth in my songs. But when I tell the truth, people care. Sure. So in the last 10 years, just from it, because we're talking broadly about a couple of things, but specifically, I always like the process and how things kind of happen behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. What has changed in kind of like a writing practice over the last 10 years where that you did this then, now you don't do it now, or it's kind of been refined to a a place where you're just getting more out of it than you were before? Well, I think um, in the last 10 years, I have become a lot more accepting of the seasons of my life. Um, this was something that Joni Mitchell said in a a documentary that PBS created. It's called a woman of heart and mind, but she was being interviewed for, um, some show or something. And she was talking about how things are seasonal. So she'll go through seasons of writing a lot of songs and then she won't pick up a guitar or write for months at a time. And then she self identifies as a painter first and foremost. So then she'll go into a season of um, a lot of painting and then return to the songwriting. And I think when I was a young songwriter, I felt this pressure on myself to be prolific or to create um, a lot of songs or a lot of good songs or to just constantly be in a generative phase. But there's no like, 
plant on earth that is bearing fruit all the time. We need seasons of, of rest. So as I've gotten older and kind of understood how I, my the rhythm of how I work, I'll go through a season of a lot of writing where I, I couldn't stop writing if I wanted to. It's like people are trying to talk to me and I'm like, I'm so sorry. I need to step out and I need to sing something into my phone really quick. I'll be back in just a couple of minutes or I need to write this down in my notebook or I need to go be by myself with my guitar. Um, and then there are seasons where I'll go for years without writing a song and I've had panic attacks about it. I've talked to other songwriting friends. I've cried on the phone. I've said, am I even a songwriter? Am I a musician? Am I an artist? But not realizing that during those times of total, what I call dry spells and what felt like not burnout, but just it felt like nothing. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't feel magnetized towards it at all. I'm also a visual artist and I do, I'm a graphic designer and I do a lot of visual art. I didn't realize that during those times I would be completely in a huge phase of output of making visual art and so now I see it in context more because I'm old enough to see with a lot longer time span and a, like a different lens of okay this is just how I work there are seasons and I can trust that even if I feel nothing towards songs right now I know that they will come back sure. when they're good and ready but there's something that is important about having like things lie latent and be undisturbed for a while like fallow fields like you can't over plant and expect to have a good harvest without giving ample time for their it to regenerate so now I'm just coming from a lot more calm and confident place because if there are no no songs coming out of me that's fine I have a, a big backlog that I can draw from and then also I can take turns playing bluegrass gigs and play bass and sing other people's songs or whatever but I'm no longer in that panicky state so I know that other songs will eventually come and I feel good about it and I'm not really worried about it I feel a lot more peaceful do you th and I've kind of noticed too with at least with what artists today are doing versus how they did things 10 years ago it was always about the, the art of the album and it was the hey we need to put 10 songs on that are all cohesive and so with the uh, live by the song die by the song you're releasing it in, in different parts they're all connected but like you said it's they're at different times of when you wrote them mm -hmm. and it's not linear has well, no, that's actually multi uh, mul the multiple albums are uh, nonlinear. So live by the song, die by the song. Mm -hmm. The reason I joined all these songs together is because they were taking place in, for the most part, in one similar time frame. That summer of 2021, I was writing. Um, there are some songs that have just never seen the light of day, like okay. High Horse, for example. I wrote that in 2011 and recorded wow. it multiple times. And then there was I brought the band down to Knoxville, Tennessee. And then there's the Lost Knoxville tapes where we no longer have the recordings and I recorded them on a podcast in 2000. Like, I have all these different iterations of the song, but I never released it, and it was always bothering me. So um, so Live by the Song, Die by the Song started out to be an EP of five songs that I wrote um, mostly in the summer of 2021, with one exception, and I just wanted to release that. But because I was printing it on physical media, I thought, you know – if I'm going to buy physical music from someone, I want to get as much like bonus content or ex exciting bonuses that I possibly can. So um, I, when I decided to press it to vinyl, I thought um, Chance Hurley and I recorded a series of videos with uh, in Kenny's studio at, at Mystery Ton Studios. So we recorded a lot of these songs and acoustic versions of a couple of the Unconditional Lover songs that will be released electrified and with, like fully produced when that album comes out. Um, so I decided to add those five, the audio of those five videos. Um, so I have a side A and a side B for the vinyl. So the side A of the vinyl is the original EP as it was in originally intended to be as a collection. And then on the other, on the B side is the five songs that I was playing with Chance Hurley during that whole same time frame that I was writing all of this and, uh, and he was definitely some, I would write something and I would send it to him immediately cause he was like my bestie. And so I'd be like, what do you think about this? And he's like, yeah, he's not a, <laughs> he's not a guy of very many words. He'd be like, it's good. Or I hate it. I won't play it. <laughs> like there's certain songs where he's like, I'm not playing with that with you. <laughs> and it's like, okay, I respect that. But, um, yeah, so it's, so I, that collection of live by the song, die by the song. It's, it's all about my experiences, um, interacting actually with every single song uh, on that album is about some kind of relationship I have with another musician or somebody who's devoted their lives sure. to music in the same way that I have. And it's kind of, um, 
I'm just the type of person that I say things better in retrospect after I've had time to digest and reflect. In the moment, I don't necessarily say what I mean in the most um, impactful way or the way I'd like to say it. I kind of am like, I wish I would have said it like this. So songs, I think a lot of times blurt out to give me that opportunity to say things the way I should have or wish I could have said them in the moment. You mentioned experiences in that. And one of the things I know Chris wanted to talk about, and you kind of alluded to earlier, playing New Spire Arts. Yes. Um, You had the experience of opening for Dennis Quaid. I did. Um, This was how long ago? Two years ago? Three years I think it was like, I don't know if it was 2020 or technically if it was 20, I think it was like 2021 when people were just starting to have shows again. Mm -hmm. How, How was it? It was great um, because I ha- my last public performance was late. It was August or October of 2019 at the Weinberg with the Unconditional Lovers. Mm. So then I was planning to have more shows. And then 2020, we didn't have shows. And then so 2021, that was, I think, my first performance back playing my own songs. Um, and so it felt kind of like getting back on the horse after it was a little nerve wracking to have not been doing it often, but he was very graceful by having us open. We played it as a duo. Um, it was chance Hurley that played with me and, um, we played a bunch of the songs off of, um, this, these projects and I have a big back catalog. So we, we played quite a bit from that and it was a really fun experience for sure. I feel thankful that I had the opportunity. That's awesome. Well, and I heard w- and th- he, pulled you out and played a song and and yeah. the, the way that i heard this story and tell me if i'm wrong it was yeah he, he said hey you should come out and play this song and you just walked out and you knew the song like no please tell me what really no. happened okay so we were in the set break between i had just played my set and he was about to play his set so there was a brief intermission and so i was very grateful to be i had a long line at the merch table i was selling records and i was selling shirts and stuff and talking to people and thanking them for coming and all of a sudden um John Healy, who is from the Weinberg Center, he's such a wonderful man, but he he was in charge of that show at the New Spire Arts, and he came over and said, Katie, I need to speak with you right away. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'm sorry, I, I can't talk right now, I'm at the merch table. And he was like, Dennis needs you. <laughs> and I'm like, Dennis? <laughs> like, Quaid needs me? <laughs> what? So um, I asked someone to take over the merch table for me, and I went backstage and uh, he was like, hey, man, because I don't know if you know this about that room, but New Spire Arts is a, a beautiful listening room. And then in the backstage area, there are monitors. So you can watch the, the act that's performing on the stage with audio and vi- and video. So you can like so he was clearly backstage hanging out and listening to our set. And so when we got pulled back, he was like, hey, man, sounded great. I want you guys to play this song with me and I was like okay great like I I was like what is it called Uh, and um and I was like oh I I know that song I my dad used to play it for me growing up he's like no it's a song I wrote with the same title and so (laughs) we went out on the stage and Chance and I had never heard the song before based on like any he just kind of was like it's it's in the key I think it was in the key of A or something like that I think he might have told us what the chords were and we just followed him and it it went really well But it was definitely like a heart attack moment because I was like, I don't want to be the one to make Dennis Quaid look or sound crappy. Not on my watch. Like, I am such an overly prepared person to a flaw. Like, I will rehearse something to death. I will prepare. I like I go to a book club and I prepare like I'm defending a dissertation. (laughs) I've got motifs. I've got analysis, character analysis. I've got metaphors like I am like a over prepared nerd. And so when he wanted (laughs) us to be improvisational, that is so far outside my comfort zone that I thought I was going to have a heart attack, which is made more uh, inconvenient and embarrassing by the it was going to be in public in front of a, a bunch of people in my community but um it ended up going really well and uh I'm did you so think about saying no like did you because like you're saying over prepared you can't say no but i'm just There's saying you no could way. though like, i could but n- none never did that ever occur to me that that was an option no, it was amazing. like dennis needs you i walk from the merch table <laughs> and then all of a sudden it was like we're his band and i was like are you trying to tell me right now that I am Dennis Quaid's band? And I looked at Chance and Chance looked at me and there was a lot of nonverbal communication. Like <laughs> we can't mess this up. I never felt more like on a team with him in my life. Cause I was like, I'll be damned. Was, was there a part of you that was like, why didn't you tell us this earlier? We could have gone over this song like three hours ago. 
Well, I think he had never heard us before. So yeah. he watched our set from backstage mm-hmm. in the green room. And so he was probably like, oh, maybe they're not so crappy after all or something <laughs> like that. So he's like, hey, guys, come and play with me. And it was such a honestly. Thank you, Dennis. It was such a generous act for him to bring us out and to have that moment that's obvious my all my family members were asking about it my mom was there like my former graphic design professor was there I mean like all these people in my life were there and it was such a special thing for him to trust us to represent him and his work well which I thought was such a vote of confidence and so it ended up making me feel confident even though in the moment I was terrified and felt like I was gonna hurl um I in retrospect I was I'm so thankful that he gave us that really special memory because I mean, who? how many people get the, the chance to say that? It's just a very unusual experience. But my whole life is like that. And I don't sure. tell people these stories because I'm not trying to like, but it's like my whole life is filled with these unbelievable little snippets. And people are like, what? No way. You didn't play with Dennis Quaid. But I did. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of unbelievable special little sn- snippets, we have our special tease special tea segment coming up. Colin, yes, you have something I, you want to say? No, I don't. I, I I don't think you're familiar with this if you haven't listened to any of the episodes. And who does? Nobody does. Nobody That's does. totally fine. Yeah. But we give you five rapid fire questions. Okay. Um, and you have 19 seconds to answer each question. Okay. Do I have a timer I can look at? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Chris is Chris is going to pull that up. Okay. And we will go back and forth. So you got to be quick and succinct. That's so not my... Those know, are the two things that are not me. Have we met? If it goes beyond 19 <laughs> seconds, it's a problem. The whole podcast shuts down it's forever. Ruined, no, no. Yeah. We'll, we'll, just, we'll move on to the next one. But it'll be okay. 19 seconds is a lot longer than It's it a feels. collapsing door underneath you. You fall into the basement. <laughs> That's where all like the where ba- they throw a ball and somebody falls in the swimming thing yes. at the yes. carnival. Yes, yes. So uh, I'll start. Okay. And so we're doing five questions total. So I'll ask a question, then Colin will ask a question. I'll ask another question. Colin will ask a question. Then I'll ask the final question, and we'll do it for 19 seconds. Deal. Here we go. Let's go. You're ready. So Are you going to keep time the whole time? Yeah, yeah, all right, all right. You got it. And again, this is our specialties, specialty segments, where if you tell them that could be better since you get 10% off. 10% off all T-shirts. All your first order. Oh. It can be anything. You stickers. Can, stickers. Socks. Um, can cozy. Can, anything you yeah. need. They, they do it all. Okay, here we Songs. go. First question. Have you seen The Parent Trap? No. <laughs> I don't that watch very, stuff. I don't watch stuff. You know this if you know me. I don't watch things. That was very quick. Here's the second question. Um, because you, uh, I don't know this about you. Where is your favorite place to eat in Frederick? <sighs> mm. Oh, that's so tough. Salads, the orchard, um, Thai food, obviously Sumitra. Um, also a huge fan of tsunami. And if I'm feeling bougie, lazy fish. Wow, that was a perfect answer. And she did it by categorizing yeah, the food. Yeah, that was That's amazing. amazing. Do you okay. want to be our guest every week? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Uh, most expensive guitar you've ever played? Um, I didn't know. It was at Austin Vintage Guitars, and I didn't know that it was on hold for Bob Dylan. Uh, it was, I can't remember. It was a <laughs> mid... Jeez. 50s Uh-oh, or 60s. You got four seconds. Gibson acoustic. I think it was a J45. Oh, perfect. Wow. God, you want to be a right. guest every question week? Okay. Four. Now, question number four. Give us three names of artists people should listen to that they might not know. Chancellor Lawson. He's based out of Kingsport, Tennessee. He's an incredible songwriter. Check him out on YouTube. He doesn't have a full album out yet. I've also shared his work on my social media. Another person. Uh, oh my gosh, there are so many. Probably. What have I been listening to lately? Teddy Grossman, he's a friend of mine who's a songwriter. Oh, who, you're at 19 oh, seconds. Uh, you're at 19 uh, seconds. Uh, Ch- he, Chance and Teddy. Song, he's, he's the a, third one. <laughs> Chance and he's Teddy. a songwriter that um, I knew from a songwriting. Um, uh, sorry, I'm shutting down. Steve <laughs> Earl mentored us on songwriting, and he's gone on to tour with – he's open for Van Morrison and Mavis Staples, and his songs are incredible. Check him out for sure. And then the third person I would probably say um, – it's over. It's okay. Okay. It's okay. I, I like, I'm like, my brain is shutting down. We got two out of three. Okay. Two out urgency, three. I, I just don't do well with urgency. It's fine. I know. It's Here's the, the okay, final the question. Final question. Okay. It is the holiday season. Is there a record or a, uh, an album that you listen to that is either brings you down for the holidays or it brings you up for the holidays? Absolutely. Um, every day after Thanksgiving, I watch um, – the last waltz by the band and i listen to their catalog and it brings me up and down at the same time because it's so beautiful and poignant especially 
uh, makes no difference with Rick Danko singing lead. He's a bass player. He's a dreamboat. And it's just very emotionally resonant. Beautiful work. Take a it. take a load off wow. Katie. Take Killed a it. load. <laughs> For someone that says, I don't do well with Epifar Question, that was better than most people. That was probably the best. That was literally the best yeah. that segment yeah. has ever gone. Yeah. You're welcome, specialties. Yeah. Flattery will get you everywhere. It's just a matter of where it is you're trying to go. Katie, thank you so much for coming on. So uh, f- we'll have all of the links to where everybody can find your stuff coming up yes. uh, in the link to the show notes. So people that are listening, you don't have to write something down when you're driving because that's not safe. Um, but you have vinyl. Yes. So live by the song, die by the song is available for pre-order right now at the vinyls here. It's actually arriving tomorrow to my house. So I'm so excited. I'm like beside myself. And then, um, I have a 10 year anniversary edition of my very first album, which is called slips of the tongue with commemorative artwork and a a bonus song that was not available on the, on the first pressing. I love that that album. Uh, Let me say that too. I remember reviewing that for the news post like 25 years ago at this point. Cause I was, and I remember I loved it. I loved the, the record. This is on vinyl. You said there's a bonus song. Hey, what did you rate it? Three and a half out of four stars. Out of four stars. And that was recorded at Smart Studios in Madison, Wisconsin, which was owned by Butch Fig. There are so many stories I could tell you about that as well. But so I'm so thankful that both of those are on vinyl, on a pallet in Wisconsin. Some of those are coming to me tomorrow so I can fulfill all my holiday pre-orders and sign all the copies that were requested. And um, But you can still order your copy at katieparterly.com. Do you have any shows coming up that people should know about? I do. In, uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, I have a show coming up. Um, an album release show which I don't know that we'll have listeners from Wisconsin but perhaps and that's December 30th and I have a full string band for that and then um, this hasn't been announced publicly yet but March 2nd I will be doing a really rare duo performance with my buddy Corey Chubb and in Hagerstown at this place called District which is a scratch kitchen and craft cocktail bar that is owned by a couple of my buddies so we'll be there super Very secret cool. breaking news will you be there me and you we're going. We'll go to District March. Do we get in? Uh, what? How much are tickets? <laughs> it's actually. Uh, Do we get ten percent off? Enter, you get to enter for free. So yes, I will give you ten percent off. Yes, yes. 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 <laughs> free. Right. Love it, Katie. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, and and now we can farewell. There could be better studios. Thank Maybe you for we'll- listening. The Could Be Better podcast is recorded at the Could Be Better studios somewhere in the middle of Maryland. This state-of-the-art facility has welcomed in everyone from Ringo Starr to 50 Cent. It it can accommodate all of your podcast needs. What? Never mind. If you like what you hear, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Threads, and Zanga. Do not forget to check out our website, www.couldbebettermeh.com. Com. Also, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Overcast, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you listen to podcasts. If you want to make sure we come back for a fourth season or don't, and maybe we'll listen to you. Well, plus, don't forget to check out all of our brother and sister podcasts exclusively within the Could Be Better network. And if all else feels, hey, please come out to a show every now and then. Wait, we do shows? <sighs> this is so much fun. I'm Chris Perry. And I'm Colin McGuire. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. And don't forget, this could always be better. The Could Be Better podcast is proud to be a part of the Could Be Better podcast network. We're passionate about creating and using these platforms to dive into topics such as exploring lo-fi, impulsive, small, and otherwise overlooked artworks and creative practices, what happened in the world this week and how to laugh through or at it, and hearing stories from musicians of all walks of life. Check out these podcasts could be better podcast this is not my magnum opus the weekly with kiki and a brand new show with stitcher called the population wherever you listen to podcasts you can visit could be better meh.com slash podcasts in the show notes to see the current shows on the could be better podcast network let's hang out as we figure out more about ourselves the community around us and why ted lasso is the greatest show of all time